Matthew 21, if you don't have one of our uh, sheets, I've placed the extras on the front row. If you want to get somebody to pass it to you, if you need one. Uh, good to see uh, our folks back this week. Jake has been gone for a while. Stephen, Ivy, and Jessica have been gone. Good to see you all back. It really is. I, uh, you may want to might want to keep your distance. They may be a little a little rrr from lack of sleep. I know I do whenever I when I fly that direction. I'm kind of messed up for a bit. So uh, and it's also good to have a uh, first time visitor this morning, Chris, with us there on the on the back row. Uh, I think several of you have introduced yourself to him already. If not, then uh, take the opportunity to do that uh, before we before we leave this morning. I told you to turn to Matthew 21, didn't I? Matthew 21. Let me get myself there. Going through our series on the parables. Uh, this is not an, a sequential, it's not a chronological order. Uh, these just, uh, uh, they, they, come as to, they come as they come. So, uh, uh, trying to get this light on here for my tired eyes. All right, let's pray as we open our service. Lord, thank you for the day and the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I pray that you would uh, take these words and, and engrave them in our hearts. Lord, cause us, to be, uh, cause us to become more like your son and more obedient to you every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Timmy, have you been in the cake frosting? Or substitute the name of one of your children. Uh, no. Are you sure you haven't been in the cake frosting? Well, maybe a little. <laughs> uh, whenever, uh, maybe you've never had a cake frosting. Maybe it's been uh, uh, crumbs around the face, or or if you're in the powdered donuts and there's there's powder on the nose. Uh, uh, sugar there, uh, it's a giveaway. Little Timmy has been in the cake frosting. And there's no way to deny it. There's no way to hide it. We will come back to this at the end of the sermon. I want to put the thought in your head now that there are Certain things, actually, let's say it this way, uh, there's nothing that can be hidden, the Bible tells us. And we're going to talk about something that should be very evident and very obvious in the life of every believer, just as much as the cake frosting is on little Timmy's face right here. We look today at the parable of the two sons. It's found in Matthew 21. We'll begin reading in verse 28. Through 31, this is a parable that occurs only in Matthew. As we think about this, Matthew is the gospel that's written to the Jews specifically. This will be important a little later on as well. Verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. He came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. We'll finish that verse as well as look at some preceding verses as we move forward. Just looking at these verses, the few things that we've looked at here, we begin we can identify the traits of this parable uh, according to the form of the studies that we've done. Now, we've got a family here that's got two sons. And so as you were hearing this, as you were hearing this intro, were you thinking to yourself, which son am I? Maybe you've got two children, and, and the two children are very different, much like these boys were. Either way, we can look at this in just the small snippet that I've given you and draw an application very quickly, and our sermon will be over in about two minutes. And you'd say, well, 
time to go to brunch. Time to head to the restaurant. We're going to have lunch really, really early. I'm not even hungry yet. What am I going to do? But we're going to look at some background of this parable, and we'll answer the questions that we have here. So what can we answer about this? Remembering the three types of parables, a similitude, uh, usually just one verse, possibly two. This one doesn't go much more than that, uh, but it's always presented in the form of a metaphor, a simile, like or as. This one does not include that. An exemplary story gives a situation where we have an example that we are clearly to follow. Now you could say, well, we could follow the example of the son who did obey afterward, but it's not really an exemplary story. It leaves, the, it leaves us with the choice that this is a narrative. And then we come to the second type. What is the topic of this parable? Uh, that wasn't supposed to be there. There's a few things there on the, that's already there. Oh, you're going to cheat and get ahead. Uh, I, I messed up on my display somehow. Um, does this deal with kingdom, redemption, prayer, positive character trait, uh, end time, stewardship? Let's look at the rest of verse 31. Whither of them twain did the will of the Father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. You see the word kingdom there. So yeah, you could underline, you could underline kingdom and put that there. Definitely it's, it falls under that, under that scheme. But also, this is a story of redemption and forgiveness. Because what we find here is that these sons represent real people that Jesus has dealt with and is dealing with at the moment He's given this parable. And there's a difference between these in that one group is obedient and the other group is disobedient. One group is redeemed, is saved. The other group, unless they were saved after this parable was told, died in their sins and went to hell. So a parable of redemption here. Again, we have two sons that are opposite in many ways. And in that, if we're looking for similar parables, we would be looking at those that represent opposites. What other parables do we have that would represent opposite things? Well, the wheat and the tares. Uh, wheat is a, is a produce crop. It's something that can be eaten. Tares is not. It's weeds. It's, it's blades of grass that does not produce any type of fruit or grain. The Pharisee and the publican going to pray at the temple. The sheep and the goats also found in the book of Matthew. Jesus tells another parable immediately following this one that could also be a similar parable. The one of the wicked husbandman. So as we look through here, thinking uh, into the study guide, is God pictured in this parable? We see here that it says a certain man had two sons. Uh, we do have God represented as that man with two sons. And who is the audience here? Who is he speaking to? We have to go back a couple of verses to see to whom he was speaking. Look back into verse 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And then Jesus gives them this answer. He asks a question. They give an answer. And then Jesus begins the parable. He's speaking here to these chief priests and elders. Are they pictured in the parable? Yes, they are. In fact, we're going to see them. Uh, we're going to see who the two sons represent. And of course, those two sons, one of them will represent these elders and chief priests that we'll be looking at here. This is one of the parables where Christ does not picture Himself directly. So He's not found in this parable. You just have a father, the Heavenly Father, and two sons, one obedient and one disobedient. Now, for us to... I'm going to skip the... Main point Jesus is making, or at least one of them, half of it, uh, I set up my slide wrong and it's already there already. We're going to come down to the customs and practices to begin thinking about what is happening here. 
what the situation is as we look at the entire chapter. We won't read the entire chapter, but we will get a glimpse of the entire chapter. This is one of the parables for which we can pinpoint the actual time that it was preached. We were able to see the very day that this was preached. Look at the first couple of verses of the chapter and you'll be able to get the context from that. When they drew nigh to Jerusalem or come to Bethpage, uh, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying unto them, Go ye into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ox tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. Without us reading the rest of the chapter, what's about to happen? What is it? The tri- triumphal entry, a.k.a. Palm Sunday, right? This is what's going to happen on Palm Sunday. We see a couple of verses later uh, that Jesus... Uh, retires from the temple. Uh, He leaves Jerusalem for Bethany, which is a nearby town. He sleeps there. He comes back the next day. On the next day is when this is preached. This is in the final week of Christ's ministry prior to his resurrection. So I'd count it, not that there's an unimportant parable, but it's going to be pretty important if Jesus is spending time on it in his last week before his death. Look down with me, verse 23. We read this verse already to see the context. We see the chief priest and the elders are the ones asking the question, By what authority doest thou these things? Jesus many times answers a question with a question to expose to them the answer to the question they ask, yet without directly saying it. Because him answering this question truthfully, honestly, which Jesus is always truthful and honest, but answering in a straightforward manner would cause him to be arrested at that point, and he still had ministry that needed to take place. Here's what he answered. Again, the question to Jesus is, by what authority do you do these things? Jesus says, I'm going to ask you a question. The baptism of John. Whence was it? Whence means from where was it? From heaven or of men? John the Baptist, what do you think about him? That's what he's asking these chief priests and elders. Do you believe that John the Baptist was a true prophet of God? Or do you believe that he just derived his his power, his popularity from men? Which was it? He asked the Pharisees and scribes, chief priests that, and here's their answers that they gave. Verse 25, they reason with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. What Jesus is saying here is this. I get my source of power from the same place as John the Baptist. If you've not received me, then you've not received him. And these Pharisees in their hearts had not believed John the Baptist's message and had not followed through on the repentance that he had commanded them to do. The hinging point here, uh, the background of the parable, has much to do with the significance of John the Baptist. That lets us see what it's about. Whenever this father in the parable asks his two sons to do something, The something is in relation to what John the Baptist preached. Now, as we see there, the common people respected John as a spokesman for God. The religious order withheld their endorsement of him. And the reason is, is because John recognized Jesus as the Son of God. And they were not willing to do that. These two sons in this parable each had two moments of decision. Once when they were presented with the Father's request. and Secondly, when they either committed to action or committed to inaction. Now, here are these two sons. I've told you that one of the sons represents the elders and chief priests, the religious order of that day, Pharisees, even the high priest. The other son, as Jesus said in verse 31, represents the publicans and harlots, the thieving tax collectors, and the women of ill repute. 
Now, this is not just any tax collector, not just any harlot, but those that heard John the Baptist's message and received it. Now you say, Pastor McCain, I'm not sure that these are the people that we'd want to be representing God's sons. I mean, when we think God's sons, we're, we would think of godly, righteous people without mistakes and sins and flaws in their past. I mean, they're going to be, they're going to clean up real nice. They're going to, they're going to dress well. They're not going to have any blemishes on their record, right? Or no? You may also think, why would Jesus give a parable and call Pharisees and elders, a chief priest, the sons of God. They didn't believe in God. They weren't converted. They had not been born again. Before you began to think that I'm preaching some uh, universal salvation or that every man is saved or that every Jew even is saved, understand this. There are two contexts under which the publicans and harlots, saved and unsaved, as well as the chief priests and scribes and elders would be considered sons of God. Should we classify chief priests and elders and tax collectors and harlots as God's children? Well, Jesus did, and here's how he did so. First of all, the Bible calls Adam God's son in Luke 3.38 in the lineage of Christ. As it begins to describe, it takes Jesus and works its way backward all the way to the very first man in Luke 3.38 Again, continuing from several verses before, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Humanity is the sons of God. And Paul goes so far in Acts 17, 29 to also state this, stating that we are the offspring of God. For without God, we would not live, nor move, nor have our being. A second way in which even the sinful scribes, Pharisees, harlots, and tax collectors would be considered sons of God is that, remember that I said to you that the book of Matthew was written to the Jews and the people of whom he's speaking are Jews. All the sons represented in the parable here are all Jews, whether they be religious, whether they be followers of God, or no. The second sort of sonship is based on a national concept. (coughs) Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. You may recognize that as a messianic psalm, but also (coughs) when Hosea wrote that, it was being mentioned (coughs) very much from the standpoint that every Israelite is a son of God in one regard. And so these two sons in this parable represent people that we might not think of as a part of the kingdom of God, like we read in in 1 John 3, 1, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we should be. Actually, that's 1 John 3, 2. Not sons of God in a regenerative manner, but on a national le- on a national manner and because of creation. So, each of these groups of people were indeed the sons of God. <clears throat> The initial contact with each son is the request from the father to go work. That represents the law. Understand this. The law was given under Moses to show mankind his sinfulness. And the expected response from that was to see that and to rely and to and to realize that there's no way I can keep these laws on my own. And because of that, I have a need for a Redeemer. And I am looking forward to the Messiah, Shiloh, the day star who will one day come, the star of Jacob, the one that we've been looking for, the prophet like unto Moses, to come and deliver us from our sins, to offer one sacrifice for all, unlike Aaron and his sons having to repeatedly sacrifice. The religious crowd loved the law and felt like they were keeping every tenet of it, even though Jesus exposed the fact that they weren't. The chief priests were pictured by the son who readily said, yes, I'll go work, because he appeared 
to be serious about keeping the law, about obeying the Father's request to work. Meanwhile, the tax collectors and the harlots made no attempt to keep the law. Look, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to operate in a way that pleases me. I'm going to get as much as I can in terms of money. I'm going to operate that. Forget the moral laws that are out there about adultery, about thou shalt not steal. I'm going to get what I can get. They made no effort to keep the law, and that's why whenever the first request came to the first son, son, go work today in my vineyard. Son, will you attempt to keep my law? The Pharisees, excuse me, the publicans, the harlots, the wicked sinners, they said, forget it. I'm not even going to try that. Whereas the Pharisees, publicans, uh, the Pharisees, scribes, and elders said, yes, we will. We'll do that. We'll keep your law. Yet we see that each of them did the opposite a little bit later. When John came preaching the message of repentance, the audience of common folk, which included publicans and sinners, many of them heard the message, repented, and even though they previously had an adversarial relationship with the law, they became obedient to their Heavenly Father by repenting and showing works meet for repentance, demonstrating the regeneration. The Pharisees and chief priests and scribes, though, were self-righteous and saw no need for repentance. While they claimed to love God and serve Jehovah God, the fact is, the truth is that they loved the expansions and additions that they had made to the law that God had given. And because of that, we can see here that the elements in this story, uh, the fact is that we see here the men in verse 23, the chief priests and the scribes, were not saved. And that's the main point. That's what Jesus is telling them very directly. You guys are not mine. You, don't, you reject me, you rejected my father. So that means that these two sons here in this pair of boar representing, uh, son number one represents a saved publican, a saved harlot. And son number two represents the unsaved scribe, elder, Pharisee, chief priest. <clears throat> to help you understand exactly what a Pharisee is, because the world likes to throw that word around a lot. Oh, you bunch of churchgoers, you're just a bunch of Pharisees, is an accusation that sometimes gets leveled toward Christians, toward people who are trying to do the right thing. I'm going to demonstrate to you that we're nothing like Pharisees whenever you see what a Pharisee was in its actual context. We have the law here in the books primarily of Exodus and Leviticus. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy repeats, uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers repeat some parts of Exodus and Leviticus. Primarily you can find the whole law there. If you divide the commandments up into individual phrases, these add up to 613 laws. Particularly in the intertestamental period, this is the period from the time that Malachi wrote until John the Baptist was born. Scribes and scholars with no new prophets or prophecies had nothing else to do but to debate the matters of the law ad nauseum. The law lays it down that the Sabbath day is to be kept holy. If I ask you to find that verse in your Bible, could you locate that? Where we're told that we're to keep the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, to remember it. Any idea what book of the Bible? Any idea what chapter? Chapter 20. Do you know what verse? If you know what verse, you're better than I. Because I don't know the verse, but I could find it by going to Exodus 20, knowing that that's where it's found. In the law, in the 613 commandments, these are laws number 87 and 88. Keep the Sabbath day holy and do no work on the Sabbath day. <laughs> so these scholars of the law had a passion for definition. They asked, well, if we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, then what is work exactly? What would be classified as work? And all kinds of things were classified as work. For example, to carry a burden on the Sabbath day is to work. 
But in order for them to know whether or not they were keeping the law or not, then we have to define burden. How much is a burden? How much is too much? And these are literal things that were debated. The scribal law lays it down that a burden is food equal in weight to one dried fig, enough wine for mixing in a goblet, milk enough for one swallow, honey enough to put upon a wound, oil enough to anoint a small member, water enough to moisten an eye salve, paper enough to write a customs house notice upon, ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet, read enough to make a pen, and it went on and on to determine exactly how much you had, so that if you had, if you had a satchel of some sort to demonstrate you weren't carrying a burden, you may be asked to show what was in your bag, and if you had more than the things that I've enumerated right here, then that's a burden. But if you have just this much food, or just this much ink, or just this much of a piece of reed, just this much water, then you're okay. That demonstrates the tediousness of keeping the law. And you can understand why Jesus said, you guys go all around the world to make a disciple, and you make him a twofold child of hell more than yourselves. And you put upon him burdens that you're not even willing to bear yourselves. Now here's some more. They spent endless hours arguing whether or not a man could lift a lamp from one place to another on the Sabbath day. Whether a tailor committed a sin if he went out with a needle pinned in his robe inadvertently. Uh, whether a woman might wear a brooch or false hair. Even if a man might go out on the Sabbath with artificial teeth or an artificial limb. If a man might pick up his child on a Sabbath day or whether or not that would be classified as work. Another prohibition you may know about in the law dealing with the Sabbath day was the distance of travel. Exodus 16.29 says this, uh, the original law says every man shall remain in his place on the Sabbath day. Well, what does place mean? Uh, does it mean uh, my bed? Does it mean my chair within a particular room? Does it mean my whole house? Does it mean my property bounds, or does it mean my city? Well, the Pharisees determined, because they really weren't interested in sitting in one chair all day, or staying in their house, or maybe just staying in the yard, they determined that one's place would be his city. And that we would also expand that to 2,000 cubits, which, twisting uh, a passage in Numbers 35, that was the amount of farmland that was given to each Levite. So if that amount of farmland was given to a Levite, then we're going to consider that a person's home and their property, which might be another 2,000 cubits, is the distance we'll allow them to go. But we're going to expand it to beyond the home. The city that I live in, even if the city is bigger than 2,000 cubits, plus another 2,000 cubits from there is how far we're permitted to travel on the Sabbath day. 2,000 cubits, in case you're curious. Um, a cubit is about 18 inches. So 2,000 cubits would be about 1,000 yards. So you can imagine the distance of walking 1,000 yards. 1,000 yards would, would not quite be a mile. Um, it's going to be about three-fifths of a mile, actually. However, they even found a way to make an exception for this, and I'll attempt to illustrate it to you on this slide here. So you've got... Two cities who are maybe uh, a little distance apart. As a matter of fact, I mentioned already Bethany and Jerusalem. And so uh, that's the cities that we'll talk about here. I thought it was going to come up with a click. So they're not very far apart. Uh, if we map the distance there, their distance, let's say, may be more like 4,000 cubits. Uh-oh, if that's a distance of 4,000 cubits, I cannot go from Bethany to Jerusalem in one day. Not going to happen. Not permitted. However, the Pharisees came up with an exception to their law. And they determined that what they could do if they needed to travel more than 2,000 cubits away from their home city, that they could make a provision where they called a place somewhere in between their home, their abode. And what they would need to do to do that is illustrated right here. So... If a man needed to make that trip on a Sabbath day, don't know why you need to make that on a Sabbath day, but if they felt like they did, a person could do this. So you got a Pharisee here who could take a meal enough for two people, 
Now, that would all be enough for me. Maybe I'd even need more than three tacos. But the Pharisee gets a, gets a meal. He travels as far as he travels as far as 2,000 cubits, his allowance. He places the meal there. Now, of course, he needs to do this on the Friday, the day before the Sabbath, the Saturday, because otherwise bearing that burden would be work. So if he plans this out on Friday, realizing he wants to make this journey, he can go 2,000 cubits from the border of his city, place a meal down, return back, and then on Saturday when he, goes, when he needs to make that journey, he can go to those 2,000 cubits and then, that, and then rest in his abode, his home, his place that he made the day before, rest, and then travel the other 2,000 cubits. Kind of ridiculous, huh? To further circumvent this rule, if a man in advance of the Sabbath uh, placed that food supply there, that became his temporary abode, which I just mentioned. And, of course, over time, that advanced preparation was ignored. A person on a journey could stop, set down a meal, call that his abode, eat, and then travel some more. And if someone was found in violation of doing this, gone were the days that they would actually stone them for, for not keeping the Sabbath. Instead, he would not be stoned. He would be able to retire to a shelter in the same way that the city of refuge was utilized for those guilty of manslaughter that we talked about back when we studied Joshua. Not at all what a city of refuge was meant for, but this is the way that the Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, and elders twisted the Scripture to make it fit what they wanted to do. I need to go 4,000 cubits. I'll just make a way around this so that I can do the thing that I want to do. <clears throat> there are 39 different prohibitions on the Sabbath in dealing with food and crops. You ladies think about what you're going to do for Sunday dinner. Maybe you've got something already preparing at the house. Maybe you're going to a restaurant. But as you think about this, consider if you were in the days of the Jews and having to keep the Sabbath, what would you permit, be permitted to do on a Sabbath day and it not count as works? Uh, here's another example of what they did. Here's some things you cannot do on Sabbath day. You cannot reap, gather, or extract. I'll talk about what extract means. <coughs> Let's say you had a muffin with raisins in it. If you pick the raisins out to eat because you liked the raisins, that would be permissible. This is what the law that the scribes and chief priests made. This is not what God said. I want you to understand this. Under their rules, you got a muffin with raisins. If you like raisins, you could pick out the raisins to eat. However, if you didn't like raisins and you picked the raisins out to set them to the side, so that you could eat the muffin, what you were doing there is you were separating the bad from the good and keeping the desirable, and you, therefore you were improving the condition of the muffin, and that would, be, that would be forbidden under the law. So wait, I can pick the raisins out and eat them, but I can't pick the raisins off and eat the muffin. That's correct. Uh, you couldn't pick the bones out of fish, because that would be considered work. You're removing the undesirable from the desirable. However, if you had fish with bones, you could pick the meat away from the skeleton, eat the meat, and leave the bones where they were. You're like, what's the difference? To the Pharisee, there was a ton of difference. To us, it seems nonsensical. Therefore, unless you operate on that sort of basis, none of us in this room are Pharisees. All right, so don't fall for that blanket accusation that the world tries to put out there that says because we try to live right, that somehow we're Pharisees. That's not it at all. Uh, here's another example of some things you could do. Uh, you couldn't juice an orange because that would be work. But you could peel the orange to eat it, and that wouldn't be work. Again, just to demonstrate some of the, uh, some of the uh, additions in the Mishnah that was made to the Bible. And all, that, all those tiny little things, all those little... Ticky-tack things that I just mentioned to the Pharisees and scribes and chief priests and elders, that was the essence of religion. Their religion was a legalism comprised of petty rules and regulations 
So while they were the son who stepped up and said, Father, I'll go, and then didn't, Father, I'll obey you. Well, in the process, they were busy creating more burdens than the average man could bear. And they weren't concerned with loving the Lord supremely and loving their neighbor as their self. <coughs> so again, how'd that happen again? I don't know. I guess I copied that slide, that slide twice. I don't know. So again here, what we find there, the second part of what was in that, the evidence of true sonship is indeed obedience. Which of these two did the will of his father? Well, it would have to be the son who said he wouldn't go, but later he went. Out of the ESCAPE acronym, which ones of these are applicable? I think what we want to see here is we want to talk about an error to avoid. Here's the error to avoid. You say, uh, Pastor, I would never dare be guilty of making up all those rules and regulations and abiding by all those things. However, when we look at the fact of who these two sons were and what they said and what they did, one said, I go, sir. And he did nothing. The other one said, I'm not doing that. And later he had a change of heart, and he did. Here's the error to avoid. Believing lip service is real service. We sit here in church, we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Or we talk about the sweet hour of prayer. And when we add up our total prayer for the week, it didn't add up to an hour. When we talk about, I love to tell the story, but we hadn't told anybody the story in three months. Lip service is not real service. I'm going to challenge you before we leave to engage in some real service this week. I located some tracks that we had back here in the cabinet, and I want us to, I want us to get rid of them. And I don't mean by that that I want us to each take a stack this thick to take them home so that they're no longer here in the cabinet. They're no longer here in a box. Here's my challenge for you. As you go out at the back table there, I would like for you to pick, out, pick up the number of tracks that you would like to give out this week. I don't care if it's one. Make a point. Give it out. You drop in the, the petrol station. You drop in the supermarket. You drop in here or there. If you offer... They'll take it. Maybe not the first person, maybe not the second person. But I've actually found that the old uh, stereotype that I was told before I came over here, that the, uh, the, British, the British won't accept your tracks. They won't, they, won't take, uh, they won't take things. They're very cold and hard toward God. I haven't seen that with the majority of the people here. They seem to be willing to engage you to accept it. Whether or not they get saved is another question. But we don't have a responsibility to save them. We have a responsibility to take the gospel to them. God does the saving. God does the working on, his heart, on their heart. And if the person doesn't have a will to get saved, nothing we can do about it. Did our job. Gave you the tract. and Gave you the plan of salvation. <coughs> Did my part. That's my challenge to you. Be obedient. By the way, it is a command for us to Take the gospel of every creature, right? That's in the Bible, right? It's there. Was that just for the men 2,000 years ago, or does it still apply for us? I believe it still applies for us. So take the, take the gospel of every creature. I have two types of tracks back there. One, uh, the front cover says, a good soldier, but lost. Obviously, that would be a good one to take to the military. The other one is just a more generic track for us civilians. Take a few of each. Again, I don't want you to grab 50 unless you plan to give out 50. I'd like for you to grab what you can distribute this week. If you have one left over next Sunday, that'll be okay. But take as much as you will distribute. Obey one of God's commands here. Do I find myself in the parable? Well, honestly, all of us are in this parable as one son or another. Theoretically, there would be 
four possibilities in terms of being asked to do something and then whether or not you obeyed it. The first possibility is this. You have someone, you ask them to do something, they say they will, and then they do it. You have a possibility of asking a son to do something. He says, I won't do it. And then he actually does not do it. But those are not the examples that are given here in this parable. If you were saved the very first time you heard the gospel, and you have been obedient, and you've tried to be obedient as you could through your whole life to God, following your conversion, then you would be the first time type of son I just described. However, I know very few people who were saved the very first time they heard the gospel. So all of us at one point have said, I will not, I will not obey the gospel, but then later did. Unless you were unsaved here this morning, then you're not the last type of person I just described, who has said, I will not hear the gospel, I will not obey it, and I'm still not obeying. The other two kinds are those who initially rejected the gospel, and then were saved, are the ones who have said, oh, yes, 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 I love the Lord. Yet they don't know God. And as I go further with this illustration, even as believers, we're either obedient sons or disobedient sons. And this really is a question that I cannot answer at all. Only you know if God has been working on you about giving something up in your life, changing the way that you do things, incorporating God's Word into part of your day every day, entering into a specific time of prayer and saying, I must do this before I can do anything else. Only you know what it is that God may be dealing with you about. And only you know whether or not you are an obedient or disobedient son. Even though sometimes it can be seen on the surface by other Christians. In terms of a Bible study, how could we take a Bible study on this parable with a lost person and turn the conversation towards salvation? Uh, you may have multiple ways, but here's, here's one that I thought of here. One where we could do this. Ask the person this question. Which do you think would be more likely to go to heaven? A person who studied the Bible his whole life or a person who heard the gospel message once? Well, as we think about that, traditional wisdom would say the first person, right? The one who studied his Bible the whole, his whole life would stand a better chance of getting to heaven. However, you can accumulate all the knowledge in the world. As a matter of fact, it was required of, it was required of every Jewish child that he handwrite a copy of the Torah, of the first five books of the Bible in his childhood. He would be familiar with the Word of God. But would he know God? In the judgment, you're going to hear people who have handled the Bible every day of their lives be told, depart from me, I never knew you. There are going to be others who we judge as bad people because of snapshots of their lives that will here be told, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What doomed the Pharisees and what saved the publicans was what each one did with Jesus. Trusting Jesus alone to enter heaven is the only way. Being a good kid or being a good adult does not equal entry to heaven. Being baptized or, or having a perfect attendance for Sunday school does not earn you entrance into heaven. Having someone pray over you or you repeating words that someone else prayed that you didn't mean in your heart is not going to cause your salvation. Trusting in Jesus Christ because there is not salvation under any other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Christ, only through grace, only by faith and not of works. That's the way to salvation. We come back to that original illustration. And I want to illustrate that picture with this point. 
the evidence of your sonship, which is your obedience, will be as vivid and as evident as the frosting on this boy's face. You can say you know the Lord, you could say you love the Lord, but if the evidence is in your life do not point to obedience to Christ and obedience to God's will, then friend, i got to tell you, you're probably not saved. Either you're not saved, or you've never been discipled and shown the importance of obedience to God and following His will for your life. Let's not fall into the trap that lip service is real service. God wants to see your actions. I don't know how many days you're going to live on this earth. Say you live 30,000 days. I have no idea how many years that is. That's probably close to like 90 years. Let's say you live on this earth for 30,000 days. And let's say that yesterday was a snapshot of one of those 30,000 days. Let's say that all of your 30,000 days was like the day that you lived yesterday. Based on that, when you stand before God, do you think He's going to let you into His heaven? Take the last week as a sample. Take the last month. If we think that because we said a prayer one day in our lives and we've lived the rest of those days in our own will, out of obedience to God, living our own way, not convicted by the Spirit, not being drawn in, not being chastened. Guys, I'm warning you. Examine yourself and see if you be in the faith. And if you're not 100% sure that you know the Lord is your Savior, we can settle that today. We can go in a side room over here. I can take the Bible and show you from God's Word how we can know for sure that we'll be on our way to heaven. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, there's a lot of meat on this parable. But it boils down to this. If we are sons, we will demonstrate that through obedience. That's what the, first, that's what the whole book of 1 John is about. If we are sons, we'll be obedient. If we're not sons, if we're not children of you, if we've never been regenerated, then we're just going to do what comes natural and be disobedient, obey our own wills. Lord, if there's someone here in this service that does not know you as their Savior, I pray they would get saved today. And Lord, for those of us who have maybe been more obedient to the Lord than we were yesterday, than we were in the previous week, Lord, may we get our hearts right get on our faces before you and align with your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, Mark is going to lead us in a final song here. You can use this as a song of, of invitation. Um, <clears throat> we, will, um, we also need to pass the plates and we need to have a time of, um, and I need to take a, a minute to tell you about the announcements. Uh, you got the number there. There it is. Um, so um, after, I mean, how many verses are in that? <clears throat> Four verses. Uh, so here's what we'll do. Uh, first two verses, if you want to just take some time and just pray as we sing these, um, just there uh, as you stand, you can um, go to the Lord in prayer and just take care of business. When we hit stanza number three, if I can have a couple of young men who will come and receive the offering, and then after you've gone through, just uh, bring it back here to the front. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind, if you drop that business card in, and that's all we—that's all we're looking for from you today. Uh, but we will sing those uh, these four verses, and then we will, um, and then I have to make just a couple of announcements just to talk about some things that I couldn't get to come up on the screen earlier.